had mentioned that the uh, Olympic, uh, he covered a lot of this, but here is in, in, in writing some of uh, um, my background. Um, chairman of the Pool and Hot Tub Alliance, the brand new the National Swimming Pool Foundation and the Association of Pool and Spot Professionals in Petco April 1st and Merge. So our public pool operator training and our building and standards groups, we're all working together and I'm pretty excited about that. Um, as he mentioned, I'm chairman of the APSP ANSI 16 gray cover standard. Um, in this video, and in, in, um, today you're going to hear it referred to a lot as ASME. That's where it started. I'll cover that in more detail. So, but no, there's no matter which four letters you see associated with the gray cover standard, there's only one technical content. So we see lots of variation, but it means the same thing. <laughs> I'm also chairman of the APSP 15 Residential Energy Efficiency Standard, um, uh, co-chair of the CMOC, the Model Aquatic Health Code and the International Swimming Pool and Spa Code Standing Committee for Code Alignment. So we have the CDC pool construction document and then we have the um, historical, going back to the 1920s, ANSI standards for pool construction. And we're making sure those two documents align so it's the same regardless of what the municipality um, adopts. And um, I'm also a voting member of the International Swimming Pool and Spa Committee. That's how I know both sides of this equation. And then ANSI 7 is a suction and craft and avoid standard that is one was uh, developed in 2005, 2006, and a lot of the policies in the BGB Act and your state level code comes from this standard. Fuel drain separation and all that kind of stuff comes from this. So we're gonna start with, um, again, this is the Pool Safely campaign. They came out in 2000 and uh, was recorded in 2009, so I think it published in 2010. These videos, of which these are just snippets I'm gonna show here today. But it's about an hour. There's seven modules, an introduction, and seven, uh, an introduction and seven model, model um, modules. And you can go online to YouTube and watch these in, in, at full length. You can share it with friends or what have you. So what I've done is focus on the key elements of it, and then um, we'll discuss. Um, we'll show some slides related to these things. So it's the same content, but delivered a little bit different. And so let me. There's three levels of authorities having jurisdiction. Obviously, the federal government that's got the broadest um, and final say on what public pool owners must do. Um, the uh, Illinois Department of Public Health, your state code, which is actually pretty good compared to a lot of other states, um, pretty consistent. There's a couple of nuances. And then, of course, uh, the, the county and health of the DuPage County, obviously, being the host of this. So, all of these um, are the authorities having jurisdiction. You know that because you're that. If we have a lot of contractors here, sometimes I got to go over the head of, you know, it's not us, it's them kind of uh, relative to the ultimate authority and working together. So, um, Relative to federal res uh, compliance responsibilities, the facility owner, the property owner, is who is obligated under federal law to comply with everything that you're going to see here. Um, there's going to be a lot of detail on installation and things like that. All of those are the property owner's responsibilities. Some of the things we will want you to look at as inspectors. And then as the pool contractor, we certainly want you to, to handle all of that. So um, designers and service technicians are also involved if anytime you're in, they're working with designing or um, installing drain covers, then they are engaging in the commerce that makes them under the jurisdiction of the law also. So Relative to property owners, there's the documentation requirement that you'll learn about that they are to have at the public pool available for your inspection in the CPSC relative to BGB compliance. And we have some uh, a form that the pool facility owners can use that should help them in that. It would be voluntary best practice that it's available. The design has to be um, in conformance, installation, operation, and maintenance. I want to highlight maintenance because we have had a fatality in a public pool since BGB. 
The AGP, the pool was compliant, but it was not maintained. So what happened, it was a multi-drain system and it was outdoor, um, surrounded by lush landscaping. Um, in the, when the leaves dropped, the pollen dropped from the surroundings. It was a public spa, all very lush in California. And um, it plugged up uh, five of the six drains. So on VGB, the flow rates we want to lot about today were crazy low, like 20% of the rating, yet we had a girl get her hair on the table and drown. Um, and it was a result of property was not maintained. So we have had an entrapment, but not on a BGB compliant pool because the act and the instructions required that properties be maintained like anything else, electrical or any of that. So it's unfortunate. Um, that's winding through a legal process now, so it hasn't made the news, and hopefully I just didn't put it on the news. Um, but I think it's important for us to understand as, as regulators. So the designers, the design needs to be um, compliant. The installation of that design needs to follow the design, just like pumps and filters and sanitizers and all of that. They can have a perfect design and then it's not built that way. We miss, we miss the, uh, the boat. The other thing is, is once the pool has been started up in the commission, it has to operate as designed. So if you miss any one of those three, then the designer and the contractors have um, not fulfilled their obligation. Relative to service, um, documentation of when covers are replaced and that kind of a thing, they should be providing that to the owner. Ultimately, the owner is responsible. So if they're buying, you know, hiring the least expensive person available, they may not get the best service that they need. Ultimately, they're responsible. Again, maintenance, I highlight that the middle one. And then repairs, if anything's broken or missing, um, this is the critical thing that has also happened since the BGB Act. It was a BGB compliant drain, but then it was broken and somebody got injured. Um, in this case, it was a um, flat break right at the end of the exit slide. There's a lot of them up here. So every time people were coming in, they were landing on this thing. Well, they're tested, but not to be beat on every minute by people coming off of the slide. It was a great big one and it cracked. It, it was a foot injury, it wasn't anything serious. But again, things happen when things are not maintained or repaired. So um, the important thing is the, is the startup for um, contractors, which we only have one in here today, so we'll have to go take this on the road, get their attention. So um, actually that's happening tomorrow. So. And then maintenance is another critical area again I will highlight for contractors and also inspectors. If you're doing an inspection, um, I'm sure you've seen, you, if you got a poorly maintained uh, kitchen facility or whatever, then all of a sudden you start paying attention to a lot of things. Same kind of concept applies here. If you see that the area is not maintained, put eyeballs on the drain, walk around the best you can. Don't go swim in much more. Um, but you know, do what you can, or if you can't see and you don't know, just asking the question, saying, hey, is, you know, I can't see in the water. Is this right? If uh, I'm a big believer in what gets monitored and gets managed, so if they know you're going to be asking questions, if not the first visit, the next time you come back, then they will do a better job. If they know you're looking over their shoulder, um, then they'll do a better job of, of getting their people to do the right thing. So, um, next, look, let's look at this kind of a compliance overview and introduction. So now we're going to go to the five forms of entrapment. So there are five forms of have, uh, um, five forms of entrapment, and these were based off of an epidemiological investigation reports from the um, Consumer Product Safety Commission. This is actually the report from the Virginia Graham Baker um, uh, case. So the APSP Technical Committee went through 155 um, investigations before coming up with the five forms of entrapment. And this data is up between 86 and 2002. So the, the percentages are different now, for sure, different with the, um, with the act. But what I want, the, we keep this in here, is if you look, 35% of the entrapments were hair entanglement. Only uh, 33 were body entrapment. That would be kind of what happened to me. And then limb entrapment is 20%. 
The most common thing was the suction would be uh, with ramps. You got held down on the drain. So that's the body entrapment. And that's what the industry and most people think of with suction entrapment. In reality, most of uh, um, the hair certainly continues to be the biggest hazard because you can have a safe drain, a tested drain with a standard that has a flow rating of 100 and you put 200 gallons a minute through it and now it's no longer safe. So the markings don't mean anything that the flow rates are not correct. Another interesting thing about this is 52% of these entrapments were residential, 40% public, 50% pool, 50% spa. So what this tells us is this happens everywhere. So um, here's a picture of the spa that ran. That's a single drain direct to a pump. Uh, and the cover is not there because it broke. So um, the five forms, oops. There we go. That was impatient. So it's hair entanglement, that's flowing water, body entrapment, which I think you understand, limb entrapment, evisceration um, or, or dis disembowelment, and then mechanical. All five of these areas, mechanical things that resulted in um, entrapments and in, in death. So let's look at flow, okay? So this is when water is um, flowing, uh, water flow is a hair entanglement issue because it's not blocked. The suction is not necessarily excessive. In fact, there could be no high suction if you think about it. It's just the hair tangling in the cover. Um, so the problem is hair gets knotted behind the cover, the wrong cover flow rating for the system. So this is a picture somewhat disguised of a, of a drain cover because um, I don't want to knock the manufacturer. But what we did is in testing, I was involved with NASA and helping develop the standard. So we tested things to failure using mannequin heads and we actually wore wigs and would swim with to see what, what was it like. Um, and so what we did is we, we ran this particular eight inch drain cover at three times its flow rate. So we were up at 300 gallons a minute, it's rated at 125. And we ruined a four thousand dollar rated process. Ah. So, um, we we ended up. I think a secretary or one of the assistants of the they spent hours untangling this together. So, um, but the important thing here is it was a very it's a very good cover, but not if you put too much water through it. And so um, shutting off the pumps is ineffective. We know this from reality. So after the air is tangled, even if you had a vacuum breaking system. Once the hair is tangled and not on it, you're, you're kind of done. So the important thing for certainly property owners, residential owners, and pool contractors is what is the actual flow rate of the pool? Residential pools, it's a real problem. There's no flow meter. So we don't know. And so that's a real challenge. And this, this question is geared right at um, uh, you know, pool contractors and service companies. Is what is your flow rate? In our case, we have flow meters that we can look at and should be looking at, and we'll cover that in a lot of detail, so I'll go into that a little bit later. So flowing water through a drain is a hair entanglement hazard. So if we look then at suction, this is what happened to Graham. This is where um, water flow is blocked, and or the suction force even with flow is sufficient to hold the person underwater. And it uh, definitely is involved, uh, resulted in injury and death. And so what happens is the suction strong enough to hold and trap. It's typically the torso, stomach, back, upper legs. In case of Graham, it was her buttock. Um, just the perfect size for that round cover and seal it off. Then what you see in the photo here is a 12 by 12 um, flat grate that was, is now illegal as a single like this, you'll still see four of them or six or whatever together. But as a single, this is prohibited. Um, our old code used to say we needed an uh, anti-vortex or approved cover or 12 by 12 or larger. And the idea being is 12 by 12 or larger was not, uh, could not be an entrapment. That being changed as a result of an entrapment here in Wheaton, Illinois, nearby. Um, and it was a 12 year old boy that sealed a 12 by 12 grade. And up to then, the um, 
the pool, those of us who, who were involved in this and, and code writers believed that 12 by 12 or larger, you were okay. And that's why it was in our codes. And then this, you know, shifted that whole paradigm and caused people to, to question that and uh, it resulting in the body block test and all of that. So that's where that came from. So the problem with the suction is that missing, lose, or damaged cover. That is the most important thing from an inspection point of view. Certainly missing covers, but missing, broken, damaged, set in place where they're not fastened down. These are where we have, that's not BGB compliant, and we continue to have those in traffic. So that's something, missing, broken, loose, and damaged covers is, is we need to spot, and I see them a lot in hotels. I travel a lot, and uh, they're out there. So that's something that you can see pretty good, pretty well from the service. So flag that. Um, Non-compliant covers in sumps. Uh, we'll talk a lot about sumps coming up. So this is a picture of a non-compliant cover in this installation. It's flat and flush mounted. So that's the um, suction side of it. And now mechanical is um, an open pipe is, um, can cause um, injury, has caused injury and death. So this is where we have an opening large enough for a hand or foot to go in. Um, this is a picture of one, these, the, there's no, these are real pictures I show, but there's no fatalities in here. Um, lid goes in and can't be pulled out. Um, pump shut, the shutting the pump off is ineffective. Actually, this is a photo of a, a pool in, I wish it was a little bit bigger, but that, there's, there's no water in this pool. The pool was drained, it was at a, a, um, a Middle Eastern hotel and the parents were letting their kids play in the drain pool and the hotel was letting people play in the drain pool and this girl put her hand in this and um, if you look here you see a little bit of ring of blue that's the blue poly pipe see these bars here that's the drain cup they were only worried about someone leaning against the pipe and ceiling we know because we, we talked to the property owners and all of that as part of this investigation so that was literally what they used for a drain cover. They ultimately have to saw cut this pool out to get our, get our, to get our arm on. And it's, we have three of them in Florida since the BGB Act. And that's a vacuum port there. So, um, so that's one form of mechanical. Another is small hole for finger entrapment, half inch drain hole like the center you see here. It's the perfect size as a ring. And so your knuckle goes in, they can't come off. It's like put the ring on that you can't get off and now you're underwater and panic and all of that. So um, this is one area of the, of the state code that we would like to see updated because it has a half inch rule. Now it's preempted by federal law. So we can't as a manufacturer, we can't make drain covers like that anymore because they don't pass the test. So for that reason, we'd like to see that kind of stuff come out of state codes and laws because it just confuses people. Um, and so uh, that's one example. Um, so the problem is broken, missing covers um, and the wrong, the wrong type of cover that's not certified. So drain covers not certified. Okay, so that's the five forms of entrapment. I don't anticipate any questions on that. And we will have time afterwards for sure. So, okay, so let's move on now to suction outlets. This gets into the meat and potatoes of this. So here's what the um, standard looked like in 1987. I told you my story. This came out uh, uh, three years after I was involved in the subject. So um, basically, it was a, it was the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. The first edition came out in 87. It was reaffirmed without changes in 1996. It had no body block test. That's why the drain covers could be flat and flush mount. Um, and it had no UV exposure test. That's why that drain cover broke um, with uh, Graham. It wouldn't have made a difference because she would she already drowned. So, uh, so there was no UV test in the for the plastic, and there was no life in years. So there was a lot of big holes in that early standard. So in 2007, um, it was uh, it was published the same year they adopted the. BGB Act and required all public pools to be compliant within one year. 
So the industry had a brand new standard that was only published in March. Federal government, so no one had designed to it and tested to it. Federal government adopts it in August. It becomes federal law in December. And manufacturers, which normally it's an 18 month to a two year process to design, test, and certify. Well, not only do they have to go through all of that, they needed to get into distribution, installed in pools, and the pools fast inspections. That was the chaos that we were around back then. Oh, Congress does that. <laughs> they mean well. And we ended up in a good place, but it was pretty brutal in the way. So what changed with that is a new body block test, and it's 18 by 23 inches, basically shoulder to hip for the 99 percentile um, man. And anything smaller than that can't be flat and flush mount. So that's why our pools and spas are full of coast only now. Because if they're flat and flush now, you can't pass the test. So a new full of head of hair test. The original standard had a ponytail test. But as soon as you went to a full head of hair with a mannequin head, then it branched out. So going right through the center of a drain or an edge, it covered the whole thing. It suctioned down to it and then trapped. So one of the very popular forward-thinking drain covers before the VGB Act couldn't pass the test. So what was perceived as the safest drain, by me included, we put a full head of hair on it, and again, we ruined another man, um, because it just knotted up under, underneath it. So that was a big impact on drain cover um, design. A new uh, UV test meant that they had to go to much more expensive plastic to make them stronger and all of that. That's behind the scenes, <coughs> all good stuff. Uh, structural testing, so after it was exposed for the equivalent of years, then they beat on them with hammers and all kinds of suction. It's a brutal test from a manufacturer's point of view, but obviously the end result's what's matter. And then a new finger and limb test um, to address that half inch opening because there was a boy in Florida who got his finger stuck in uh, that, that drain cover, one, that model, not that one, the bottom of the residential pool, eight foot deep in the ground. Then the other real important thing is a life in years designation, because nothing lasts forever. You know, even up here in the desert, it turns to dust and seed. Uh, up here, you probably get two or three years before your lawn furniture starts to get grilled, and, but it still happens, UV. And um, to understand, is the reason water is blue is because ultraviolet light passes through it. All the red stuff reflects off. So that's why clear water is blue. And so if you put a plastic cover, anything plastic on the deck, and then put the same part 10 feet underwater, that underwater part is going to get 98% of the UV damage is the one on the deck. This explains why I always got sunburn as a kid, even though I was underwater most you, you still get summer. So that's why um, outdoor pools in particular is the UV degradation is happening even though those, those are underwater. 10 feet, 98% of the UV summer is still coming. So I mentioned earlier that the 2007 is ASME. So this is the original standard. And that went into effect in 2007. Then in 2008, after that mess I just described with the Congress and everybody having to scramble to design, test, certify, get it installed, everyone was mad at ASME, and it wasn't their fault. Um, but nonetheless, they were like, they have three swimming pool standards. And it became such a mess, they're like, we want it. We don't want any part of this. So they gave the standard back to ANSI and said, take it. We don't want it. And they sent letters, certified letters to all our manufacturers said, quit using our logo and our, our name on it. So I called Troy and I'm like, man, we got a problem. What are we gonna do here? And uh, so their CPSC solution in 2008 was to designate VGB 2008 as what we manufacturers had to mark on our covers in the interim. So you will see VGB, uh, VGB 2008 on covers uh, frequently. That was in effect through 2011. 2011, ANSI moved the standard to the Association of Pools of Professions. So that's the APSP 16 designation. It's just the 16th standard in the series produced by the Association of Pools of Professions. 
So that's 2011 is when that went into effect, and that's current to this day. There is a revision that they're looking at, but that's not here yet, so we'll, we'll save that discussion for another day. It really clarifies what manufacturers and test labs need to do. So, um, so the, the requirements, and this is the key, the requirements did not change across any of these documents. Just the logos changed. So these designations all mean the same thing. The original was ANSI, ASME ANSI A1 2007. There was a modification to it in 2008, Addenda A, and then another one in 2009. There were technical tweaks to the plastics testing and stuff. It doesn't matter to you. Um, all three of those thing, standards mean the identical thing. Then we have the VGB 2008 and the ANSI APSP 16 2011. You can and will see all of these on drain covers, they all mean the same thing. So confusing, but that's what you get. So here is the um, you know the APSB 16 standard what it looks like today, and there's audio for this next two tests, but it won't matter. So the first video I'm going to show you here. This is the um, body block test, the 18 by 23 um, blocking element. So that's being pushed down on the drain covers. This is an unblockable 18 by 36 drain cover that's being tested. So you can see open area around it. So that's two inches of foam that's supposed to represent, I think the block would have to be, but um, two inches of what we, some of us carry around the middle, and then it's plywood blacking. And because it's all very buoyant, the steel you see is just to, to keep it um, buoyant under water. So it's pushed down with 120 pounds. It does, you can't even see it on this because it's a flat cover, but when you get your round mushroom shape or your round domes, it mashes down around them. And if they're not tall enough, then it seals against the floor and you fail the test. So that's why our drain covers stick up. And the smaller they are, the higher they tend to stick up because they got to keep that blocking element from sealing. So, here is um, the hair test. That's this is the full head of hair test. It's a very short version of it, but basically um, that mannequin head and also ponytail is waved, and there's no waving motion in this video. But wave for a minute. It holds for 30 seconds. Then you let it float for 30 seconds, and then pull it. So this whole test with the pump running full tilt boogie. 100% of the flow through the single drain, and it has to be able to pass the test without exceeding five pounds of pull. To give you a sense of how conservative that is, that blonde hair, if you take two of them, twist them together, and then break it, is about 11 pounds. So if you tangle a pair of hairs in this test, and they twist behind it, you're going to fail. So I give you that background to say this is a very thorough and very tough test. So we can trust these products that are certified, but we do have to make sure they're installed correctly. So it gives you some sense of what's going on. And the ponytail test is just like that, only it's just a small ponytail. Um, but originally it was talked about pulling that out. But what we found is the full head and hair test is 80% of the time is what limits the flow rate. But ponytails with some of the channel drains and things where they can sneak in a corner and go in a pipe, it became a limiting factor there where the pull head of hair blocked the flow, and so it wouldn't go into the pipe. And so originally we were just going to dump the ponytail and go full head of hair, and then we did testing with well, okay, so now they're both. So the price keeps going up for manufacturers. <laughs> but it, the, the end result, it works well. So under the finger entrapment, this was the other element that was added. Um, added. It's uh, designed to prevent um, certification of ring-like openings. And this, the, it, it does prevent, prevent um, openings one inches or, long, uh, or uh, larger. And that's uh, to prevent like a small toddler, actually an infant-sized hand, we actually measure 
to make sure we drive things. Uh, one of my coworkers, his wife did a daycare thing. So we took some plastic dry parts and, and just figured out, okay, what's the limits of these things? And then that was submitted to ASME and was the driving factor behind us to address these hazards. Um, it does allow larger openings for debris removal, but they have to be big, deep channels that are very smooth so fingers can go in and can come back out, but it's too small. So there are some channel drains um, and debris removal drains that have great big openings on them, but they're, as long as they're certified, they're okay. So that's where your code will be more restrictive and those can't be used in public pools in Illinois because your current code has a half-age rule. Okay, so there it's more restrictive. The federal law on smaller openings in that half age, they won't pass, so they can't be certified. But then your state law kicks in and says you can't use the debris removal drains. And ideally, well, I'm not a big fan of those in public pools, certainly we want them to be allowed in residential So that's an example of, um, of where your state code is more restrictive. Um, and that's where that bottom bullet point is. The one thing I'll point out on this is this, um, this is called a UL articulated probe. It comes from the playground and electrical fan kinds of standards. So it's the, the finger is the length of an NBA basketball player, monster hand. But the, the, the size of it is a, a, a toddler. So you've got, you know, so it's this real long, thin, finger probe, and the whole idea is they test it to make sure you can't reach in through the straddles on the fan, get your fingers chopped off, pinch points, there's a lot of technical stuff that goes with the, uh, the playground equipment, and so we use that, once we identified what the problems were, what we needed to eliminate, we started playing with this thing, and everything that we said we need these to fail, it fails, and everything that we wanted to pass, pass, so um, fortunately we didn't have to reinvent that. So the combination of the body test, the full head of hair, this finger probe is why drain covers change so dramatically across the board. So there's a new term um, in the new standard, but we, we are using it already, and that's the suction outlet fitting assembly. And that encompasses everything from the cover itself, the fastener, the mounting, everything it takes to connect to the suction pipe. So it's a suction outlet fitting assembly. So when you hear drain cover, know it's everything underneath it. It's not just the drain cover. And that's been true all along, but it's not been widely uh, understood. So we came up with the suction outlet fitting assembly and absolutely hate it because it's so, we were literally over a year trying to come up with something else. And we finally said, you know what? People are gonna remember it. It's the technically accurate, you know, don't sit on the sofa. <laughs> We hate it, but nonetheless, it, it is, it just inaccurately describes what's going on. So now drain cover is used in the Virginia Grand Baker Pool Spa Safety Area. Um, one of the changes that was made is we went from drain covers to suction outlets because that's the more technically correct. The CPSC has asked us to quit calling them suction outlets because no one knows what we're talking about, and we're back to calling them drain covers. So the engineers and the NASA scientists are just going bananas because it's not correct. We don't drain pools, we, don't. We, we, we suck the water to the pump. So anyway, uh, some of the behind the scenes proving I don't have a life. But, um, so the suction outlet fitting assembly is all components including the cover grate used to attach the cover or grate to the finished surface of the pool and to the individual suction system. So in this, we see a vinyl liner clamping ring. So it's what it takes to clamp it to the inside of the pool. And then this has got a couple of different sides of you know, drain ports that you connect to the pipe. So all of that is what constitutes a suction outlet fitting that we refer to throughout this presentation as drain covers or suction fittings. They all mean the same thing. So um, one of the other concepts that's currently in the standard is a field built sump. And so that just is this space. This is a concrete structure. It's the only place we see these is in concrete pools. So we have a dish out, pipe sticks through the concrete, and they carve out an area below, um, around the pipe, 
They fill it with plaster and mount the frame, the drain cover mounts to. And so this is all made of the pool structure. And so one of the specifications of every single drain cover is we have to provide a sump depth. And so sump depth is measured from the top of the pipe to the surface of the pool. That's where we're going. That's what the new standard is going to require. Submerged suction outlets. Um, this is the current standard, section 2.34. So it says basically that pool manufacturers can make drain covers that um, attach directly to uh, the pipe with a plastic sump bucket, stainless steel, fiberglass, whatever it be, or we can make it out of concrete. Either is okay. Those that do not connect to circulation piping have to have that sump depth specified by us as the manufacturer. So we got to tell you what are those dimensions. And in this regard, we need to, you can get into this detail, certainly the contractors will need to, is look at the specific cover instructions on how you measure this, because the standard says to measure from the other side of the cover. Well, now they stick up and are known, and how do you do that? You can't, there's no way to do it. So we change and take the cover off and measure the depth. Uh, manufacturers, certainly Aquastar included, will give you all of those dimensions in our instructions. So you can go with the cover off, measure down to the pipe, and it'll tell you it's two inches, where even though the sump depth is three inches, that's because the cover sticks up an inch. So it's a little bit complicated, but we'll have, to have more graphics coming up. Now, here's the element. Alternatively, a sump built in accordance with figure two shall be permitted. So if a manufacturer, this goes back to 19, or 2004 and five, and manufacturers didn't know what, we didn't know what we were doing basically. And so they wouldn't provide any uh, instructions for drain covers. So the installers, we put the pipe right up against the bottom. We'll see an example in a public pool of this. Well, now we have, instead of an eight inch drain cover, we got a two inch size of the pipe. And the flow rate is everything about it's long. It doesn't match anything that was tested. And so the idea to prevent that was to allow, for manufacturers who didn't do it, that they could just use one and a half pipe diameters. So this is the figure two that's in the current standard. Um, and so one and a half pipe diameters is from here that's measured. If this is one diameter or two inch, then that has to be three inch. And so um, this was an allowance built in the standard that has been pulled out. The first figure two I showed you with the sump is where it's going. So one of the things I want to make, uh, I'll reiterate more than once, is many manufacturers require compliance with figure two. So they don't give you dimensions. They say, just figure it out based on figure two. Um, so be aware of that. So if the instructions say, follow figure two, and the pool is not a figure two sump, that is not a compliant installation. Um, Federal law requires that manufacturer's instructions be followed, and if not, it's not compliant. So what we want to do is we emphasize that the contractors and the installers are actually doing this work. They need to pay attention to it. It's just unreasonable for you guys to need to figure this out. So I would encourage you to ask, what's your sump now? And when you get the glazed over look, year one, say, next year, maybe give them the form we'll look at later, so I fill this out next. This is my best practice suggestion is, you know, say you get them all again this year. The next time we come back, you better have this answer. Kind of thing. Here's a little bit closer view. One of the things I want to call to your attention is here's the different dimension for one and a half pipe diameter. So it's an inch and a half pipe. We need two and a quarter. It's three inch and four and a half. So on and so forth. And it's 15. But also pay attention to this, I would uh, highlight to my contractor friends and colleagues, is if you've got a, a manufacturer cover that requires a one and a half, a figure two sump that please don't lose track of the one diameter of the edge. Okay, often we're not getting that dimension on the side. And uh, I have a slide coming up um, of that detail for you coming up later. So you're going to see this slide again, we're going to talk about it in a little bit more detail. Okay, so let's talk about the walkable drain. Um, that term was first used in the Virginia Grand Baker Act. The ice, I read in law and was like, what is this? Um, Congress came up with this term. Um, 
And at first we kind of freaked out, honestly. And then we started, well, what does that line mean? Um, and we realized, well, the concept of unblockable is not new. We have, you know, 18 by 36 inch grates that are unblockable relative. They can't be blocked by that body blocking element. Channel drains, even though they're only four inch wide, they're real long, so they can't be blocked. And why this is important is, um, is if it's a single blockable drain under the federal law, it triggers the requirement for the backup system. We'll go into detail on that coming up. So, but understand this is a very important concept of unblockable drains. Here is a, a classic example of uh, one here, you got the 99 percentile band, so you can see it's from the shoulders to the hips. And then, um, and then the open area, so here's that body blocking element. This is a photo of the real test element, and this is a 24 by 24. And so you can see once it's blocked, we have this open area here in these corners. And while it's blocked, the pump's running full tilt boogie. It has to be able to be removed with less than 120 pounds for an unblockable um, it to pass the test. You know, so let me explain 120 pounds because it seems like a really big number. It did to a lot of people. So a 99 percentile man weighs um, 240 pounds. Okay, that's a statistical number. And they're the size 18 by 23. The concept is, is exploring and then testing, literal testing pools if this was done, is they're big enough to block an 18 by 18. Okay, so we gotta be able to get off of this thing. If they weigh 240 pounds and have the ability to get up off the floor, get out of bed right there, we lift, not 240 fortunately, but every day I lift more weight than I'd like to think about. And the idea is when you're in water and 100% buoyant, especially if you're overweight, um, then and you're capable of lifting your whole body weight, then you should be able to easily use half of your body weight to get up off of a fluid drain. And we conclusively proved that it's conservative and you lift an arm. And, and so that number seemed really big, but in reality, it's very conservative compared to the strength. Now it scales as the drain cover gets smaller, they can't block it anymore, but a child can't, or they can, but they got more than enough strength to get off. So if you go clear down to an eight inch drain that can be blocked literally by a toddler that weighs 30 pounds, the force limit for that is 15, half of their weight. And so it scales, so the force limit on a small drain is 15 pounds, a 12 by 12 is 37 pounds to give you a sense, and then you go up to the unblockables, it's 120. All of that is based on half of the person who can block its body weight. Um, so that's where it came from, comes from. So um, the, and the unblockable outlet is determined by the outlet size under the cover. So take the cover off and how big is that opening? And the question is, can it be shattered? If it can be completely hidden under the blocking element, then it is blockable. We have to do a backup system. If it sticks out in any direction, then it's unblockable, and you only need one. Now, the what happens is you might be able to, you know, this is a 24 by 24. But once you block it, now the flow rate in one and a half feet per second is up at 14, 1500 gallons a minute. But as soon as you run the real test on it, now because of the suction, it drops down into four or 500. So that's why you will not see 24 by 24 is very much in new pools that have been designed since this because their flow rate is terrible compared to just changing the shape of the drain. So they're still legal, but they just have a lower flow rate. So that's the unblockable. Um, and the important thing is when it's an unblockable, it has an unblockable designation, you don't need a secondary system or device. So here, let's look at some variations of this. The 24 by 24, we just saw the physical picture of it. There's um, 18 by 36, as I don't have a picture of that, but we saw one in the video. Uh, four by 32 channel drains. So even though you turn this on an angle, there's still um, open area. And their flow rating is based when blocked. And this is just the concept of the dual drain. 
Um, and then up, up above here, there are some 20 inch circles on the market. They don't stick out much from the edge, but their flow rate is based on this test. So another aspect of, the, um, of these blockables is because they pass the test, they can be flat and flush mount, and often will be flat and flush mount. So this is a good uh, graphic we use at trade shows and all that. It kind of summarizes this critical issue without getting into the detail of how you measure it. But on the left is an unblockable, no additional requirements re um, for that. It could be just standalone. Um, so it's a single cover, and the flow rating of the pool is the cover flow rate. Okay, when you have dual drains like that, or a blockable drain on the right, um, because it's blockable, now it needs a secondary device, SVRS, multiple drains, it needs something else, it can't be by itself. And so, and its system flow rating, we'll go into more detail on that, but <coughs> is you assume one's blocked, and then the BGB flow rating of the system is the remainder. So if you have two, you subtract one. If you have three, you subtract one. If you have four, you subtract one. Um, and that's how you do the math to find out what pool flow rating is. Some of the other things to be aware of, uh, common manufacturer ins um, uh, instruction requirements. Uh, sump depth is required for figure two. They are very rare in small, what I call residential pools in a public pool environment, your Hampton Inns, your, you know, your hotel, motel, apartment, kinds of, it's a residential pool, but it's a public pool. Um, those concrete pools, that sump is very rarely ever meeting figure two. So the contractors need to be aware of that and it would be helpful for you to bring that to, to attention. This is not a shut, in my opinion, this is not a shut down pool issue. Um, CPSC kind of feels otherwise, but I'm going to give you my opinion. Is um, if the flow rate, if it's a spa, Hot tub, a wading pool, kiddie pool, don't, don't, don't cut any corners there. You know, make them prove it and all that, because those are the high risk things. But if it's out in a, 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 you know, a deep water pool, even, I call deep water anything beyond a spa, three or four feet, certainly if we're looking at the diving well of an auditorium, um, yeah, I, I personally wouldn't even waste the time asking something that, because of it, you know, it, just no one's going to get down. Um, so it's kind of prioritized prioritizing, but watch the drain cover. Some of the very popular ones require um, to uh, sump that issue. Multiple outlet use only. Some of the major manufacturers want nothing to do with the SVRS devices they sell. Tell them. Um, and so they say, you can't use our single, our eight inch drain cover with our SVRS pump, because we don't trust them. We, we, we only go buy office money. We don't want to deal with this. Go buy somebody else's. So the contractors need to be aware, please follow the instructions because if anything bad happens, unrelated to BGB or whatever, as soon as a lawyer's involved, I guarantee you they're gonna read those instructions and they start nailing on everything, bonding, anything and everything. So protect yourself, contractors, uh, protect yourself from everybody. Um, the other element, um, the act requires that the manufacturer's instructions be followed. And um, so if the manufacturer requires you got to use two um, drains and the pool only has one, it's not BGD compliant, even though it might have an SVRS and all of that. Um, from a health department inspection, this again, ask the contractor, what, you know, look at the instructions. I don't really think this is something that you guys will need to and have the time to look at, but we're covering absolutely everything here today. So let's look at suction covers and how the um, Illinois Department of Public Health, okay, so they have some specific policies and um, they a permit is required to change the drain cover make or model. So we have existing pools. They've got an expired cover. What if, for whatever reason, it's time to change them out. If they're not going to use a like-for-like -like model, then a permit is required. So let's look at, and this detail comes directly from the state, and they asked us to present this on their behalf. So 
the IDPH replacement of existing drain covers do not require a permit if the exact make and model is available. So if you do a like for like, no permit required. Be aware, like for like allowed only if the original installation was um, correct, including the flow rating, sump depth, and the manufacturer's instructions were followed. So under federal law, if it wasn't right to begin with, it's not legal to replace like for like. So the proper cover, the one that's compatible with the system, flow rate, whatever the issue is, needs to be sourced and specified and a permit needs to be um, submitted to make that happen. Um, so that's, uh, so we got potential conflicts of timing if nothing else there. Um, so if, item number two, replacement of existing drain covers that are not identical make and model will require a permit. Um, and then they had examples are covers that were recalled, uh, changed model numbers, or no longer available. So I can tell you, speaking on behalf of Aquastar, we had drain covers recalled. It was because they weren't tested correctly. I don't like throwing the test labs under the bus, but they did it, so we don't want to back this bus up again. Um, it was a mess for all of us. All of those drain covers were dealt with and pulled off the market. So while, yeah, it's technically a factor, they've been gone for five years. So they're not even available, that shouldn't. So if they try and do it like for like, and it's been a recall drain cover, it's not gonna be in the market. So they're not gonna be able to get one to replace it. So it should be a self-solving problem in that regard. Um, there are examples where, you know, we as a manufacturer discontinue old models for whatever reason. We don't like to look at them, we're not selling a lot of them. We got a duplicate or a better new and improved. So there are cases where we quit making them. If they can still be found in the marketplace, then there's, there's not, they're not illegal. It's like a buying a car that's three model years old, brand new from a dealership. And they discount the heck out of it because they want it off their, it's still a brand new vehicle, it's still okay. It's just not the current model. So that's an important thing uh, there relative to no longer available. Um, again, the, the VGB Act requires that those covers, the new cover, have the proper flow rate, some depth specifications, all the same kind of things. So, um, when not a like for like replacement, the contract the pool owner will need to get a permit out of that process works. So, now there's another category field fabricated outlets. Now, field fabricated outlets are designed by engineers, professional engineers, and they're doing the whole thing. They do the cover, potentially, the grading, the design, the sump. So they're going to specify everything. They can even make these out of stainless steel. So there's nothing certified by a UL, NSF, IAC, or any of that. The certifying agents. Um, in these cases, so if it's a field fabricated outlet, designed by an engineer on the big natatorium plans, so to speak, then those always require a replace uh, um, a permit. So even if they're doing a like for like, they're just gonna take the eyebars, fiberglass grading off and replace it with the identical product, the state wants to review all of those. Okay, so if it's a field fabricated outlet, the state wants to review those. Same things apply. It is CPSC, they don't care what the state policy is. It has to meet all of the um, specifications. Now, in the case of this, there's no instructions from a manufacturer, no certification from UL or IAPL or NSF. So it's just a report from the engineer, and they are obligated to provide that to a property owner that documents all kinds of things. And I have a slide in there that will show the laundry list of things they need to provide. Bottom line is the professional engineer has to meet everything we as a manufacturer does, but they don't use a test line, they're certifying it themselves. They're good at it, so it's not a big deal, but um, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're pros. But it, it, those will require a permit. So recertification of existing allowed uh, it, um, designs allowed by the BGB Act only if the original was not correct. Probably a theme there, you see. 
is just because it's in the pool, especially that stuff that was done in that first year, when it was like, well, it kind of fits, and it's available, we'll get the pool open. There's a lot of that stuff, and that's what we want to catch. So, uh, so the cover, so field fabricated um, outlet, the engineering report needs to contain the cover grade security fasteners, so how is it attached? Um, user maintenance instructions, and I think this is one that maybe you're going to have to do more on, because they say, well, it's just on my blueprints. Well, the pool operator's not going to go read the blueprints to know how to maintain the ground. So they might need to beef up that a little bit under these new environments. Um, flow hazards, well, they're just going to do a proper design, so that's kind of built in. Um, and the flow rate, they'll provide that. And then installation requirements, and um, here's everything you see in red here, are all things, the ultraviolet test, floor, um, load deformation, all this engineering stuff, they have to address in the report. And a lot of cases, like we sell Aquastar and many other, uh, Del Rado, Neptune Benson. Sure, there's two more. <coughs> I'm trying to be fair to all the other manufacturers. They sell the grading that gets used by the engineer. So all of the stuff in red will be provided by Aquastar or Del Rock or whatever. And then so all the UV loading, that goes to the designer who then includes it in the report. If they do 100% of it themselves, then they have a lot of um, work to, to do. And they do that regularly on stainless steel side. I mean, because it's easy to patch UV and do it for that many times. It's steel, it doesn't, it's, it's the plastic that that section is designed for. Um, there's another requirement under the federal law, and that's to, they have to produce a general certificate of conformity, and that came in in 2007, or excuse me, 10, as part of the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act, and that applies to all products the CPSC is responsible for. The cribs, the car seats, all of that, the manufacturer, or the engineer in this case has to do a uh, general certificate of conformity that says this is who I am you know so if you look up at all the manufacturers you'll see who we are what the cover is what's its rating all the life figures all that detail is summarized in that document that's a federal requirement for the federal government so that you know that we're we're testing as a manufacturer and engineer that we're meeting the federal law and we put it in writing and if our product doesn't match, guess what the lawyers will back. So it's a technical legal document, but it can be quite useful um, for summarizing looking at drain covers lists versus through a catalog or something like that. Uh, my, to my knowledge, all the manufacturers have those available for download on their website and they're specific, specific to each drain cover. Um, so, if you're interested in that level of detail, they're kind of an interesting summary document. Uh, you might ask the um, uh, pool operator for a copy of it. They may not know about it, but they're, they're pretty handy tool unrelated to the VGB Act that came in as a bigger scope for car receipts and all that stuff. So, um, last point on this, and then we'll take a break, is these are not the field built sump. Figure two, the concrete carve out, all that stuff. It's not what this is. These requirements don't apply to that. When it's a manufactured plastic cover over a, a field built sump. Um, so just don't confuse the name. In the new standard, these field fabricated outlets have been renamed for professional engineered outlet, just so we can get rid of the confusion. But um, content didn't change. So we're going to talk about flow rate and measuring TDH. And so this is intimidating even for folks in the pool industry. So by the end of this set of um, slides, I think you'll have a grasp of what you need to know in the value of TDH. Um, you're not the engineer, we don't want you to be the engineer, but this is an important concept that um, the better you understand, I think you'll find it could be a tool useful beyond even VGB compliance. And that's, uh, but certainly flow rates are important to our water quality. Um, and then measuring TDH is a good way to figure out if the system is anywhere near close to the way it's intended to be operated. So with that, we're gonna get into module three, understanding flow rate and TDH. Key here, flow, 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 is excessive flow entangles here. And we've seen this picture on the left before, 
And this was a certified, it's a very good, high quality drain cover, but you put too big a pump behind it or put it on the system with too big of a pump and um, we can have hair entanglement. So one of the ways that we can, he mentioned the, the flow meter, is um, how can we check to see if the flow meter is even close? And so here is a slide that should just be snapping to get it, right? <laughs> Not. Um, so I'm gonna, I just wanna expose this slide to you. We're gonna learn more about what TDH is and how to measure it. And then I'm gonna come back to this slide at the end of this set, and we're going to um, uh, deal with it in a little more detail. But at the highest level, these two dots are um, the measured flowing. This is a real pool in San Antonio that we had to try to figure out what was going on. So the uh, here was a flow measurement of uh, 25 gallons a minute is what the flow meter said, and that was with the drains only, so skimmer valve off, just the water going through the drains, and that's all we care about for BGB compliance, because if it's only water going through the drain covers, that's the hazard, not what's going in the gutter or the flow system or the, or the skimmer. So, and you can see this system is very restrictive, this will make more sense after these future slides, is um, this is, you know, very restrictive, uh, system versus when you open the gutter overflow system, water can now flow through that too. But in both cases, we have 25 gallons a minute measured on the flow meter um, with the drains only and 60 gallons a minute on the, um, on the total system flow. And we knew that could not be right based on the pump. So when we adjust over and say, okay, this TDH, here's our flow rates, those are the correct numbers. So that's a, we're gonna come back to this. I just wanted to say that once, and then, um, so that maybe this will make more sense moving forward. So let's talk about what is total dynamic head. And total dynamic head is the units of measure that a pump is working, it's how hard the, the pump is working to move water. So it's the size of the pipe, how high it needs to pump. So if we go from a, a, a pool to a slot, right? The stack, well, it has to overcome all of that feet of head or that resistance, plus the water moving through the elbows, filters, all of those things create resistance. The more the resistance, the um, lower the compression. So if we look at pump curves, that's on the right, all Manufacturers publish a pump curve, and it's very important from an engineering point of view. So across the bottom is flow rate. So zero on the, the left, and then uh, bigger numbers to the right. And then the other axis is pressure. That's how, how much pressure or back pressure is on the pump. So if we think about a valve somewhere in the system after the pump, and if we have a valve, if we close it clear to zero, our flow goes to zero, right? flows off and the pressure behind the valve is gonna go way up. Now open that valve all the way up. Flow goes up, the pressure comes down, just like your garden hose when you spray it or use your thumb over it. Same kinds of concepts. And so pressure and flow are directly related based on the model of the pump. And so that's, um, that's how pump curves are used. So if we look at this set of pump curves, here we have everything from a three horsepower pump to a half horsepower pump and everything in between and then two speed or below, these are low speed down here. These are the different system curves um, related to those. So if we look here at this dandy plumbing job, all the elbows and valves and all of that, well, the pump has to work really hard to push water through it. So it has a lot of high back pressure and low flow versus the same pump on a very clean system will have less resistance and move more flow. Okay, so that's what TDH is teaching us and we can use it as a tool to validate whether or not the flow meter on the public pool is anywhere close to right. And we only need it close. From a turnover point of view, whether we turn over a pool in six hours and 20 minutes or five hours and 40 minutes in the public health world that 
doesn't matter, right? It really doesn't matter. It's just we want to know that we're, we're relatively close. It's more important for AGB compliance, for sure, so we want to pay attention uh, more closely there. So this is TDH kind of and how it is applied. Here's how it can be measured. Contractors do this all the time. Um, some health departments, Las Vegas is notorious. They record TDH with staff on all of their pools, but they did it out of self-defense. If you've been to Vegas, you've noticed they got some oddball water features and pools, and, and you can't even get it to the high road so if you want to see scary stuff. I've seen some of this stuff. They do weird stuff in the flow meters. There's no room and they don't trust it. So they, they do TDH on everything. Not for BGB compliance. They want to make sure they get the water turnover rate because there's weird stuff that happens in those things. <laughs> Go to YouTube. Oh, don't. It's embarrassing. Um, so here's how that's done. So they measure either out of the pipe, so your vacuum gauge in San Antonio, where we did a lot of this, we pulled the vacuum gauge that's required and connected a tube to it. We pulled the pressure gauge, connected a tube to it. Now that's not real accurate relative to the pump curve because the pump curve is done in a lab right next to it, but it's plenty close enough. And so what you do is you connect the pump suction. This is the easy thing with pump, plastic pumps. Pull the drain plug, which I didn't even know they existed coming from the desert. You know, the only place we ever see ice is in the freezer. So I didn't even know pumps had these things when I saw it. I was like, what the heck is that for? Winterizing. What is winterizing? Proving I grew up in the desert. So, so there's a drain plug on the suction side of the pump and then also on the pressure side. And so if you record that, the suction side is in inches of mercury and 1.13 inches of mercury equals one foot of water. Pump curves are done in feet, so we need to get to units of feet. And then pressure, one pound per square inch, one PSI equals 2.31 feet of water. So do a call, water column this tall and put a pressure gauge at the bottom of it, it's going to be one PSI. And actually, if you do a one by one square, 2.3 feet tall, it weighs one pound on the scale. This is one pound per square inch. So we just need to convert to those, and what we're going to do is we're going to add the vacuum, we're going to add the pressure, and the combined is total dynamic head. So if we go back to our pump curve and we look at an example, so we're going to say we measured the vacuum on the pump and it, on the vacuum gauge it was 10 inches of mercury. Okay, so we multiply 10 times 1.13, the conversion factor, to get inches of mercury to feed of water. So that answer is 11 feet. The pressure side of the same pool, we measured 23 PSI on the pressure gauge. We convert that to feet of water by multiplying it by 2.31. So we have 53 feet of head on the pressure side of the pump. When you add those two together, you end up with 64 feet of head as measured at that pump. So now let's go look at the pump curve. You, have, you need to know what model it is. So you go to 64 feet of head. You find 64 on the chart, come over to the intersect point, and go straight down. This pool is operating at 88 gallons a minute. So that's how TDH is used. So now let's go back to, everybody got their head around that concept? So now let me go back into that first slide and show you how we use this. Um, so here we have on the left, Okay, we have the uh, flow meter reads 25 and 60. So this was a research project for energy efficiency. We looked at that and said 25 and 60 doesn't align no way with this pump. Something wrong. Is it a different pump? What's wrong here? So it turns out it was the flow meters. And the way we quantified that for the Texas Department of Health said it's got to intersect something. So what we did is we said, okay, here's what the flow meters read and our and TDH. So we looked at our measured TDH, move over to the pump curve, and then come down. So we know that the real number was 58 gallons a minute. And then when the skimmers and all that was working, it was 70, uh, 79. So from a VGB compliance point of view, the um, 30, the flow meter was off by 60%. That's a big number, that's what we care. Now, as it turns out, these are small flow rates, so the 100 GPM 
drape covers were still okay. This was never a, a um, question on VGB compliance in this particular pool. It was all about hard quality. So, and then likewise for the, um, it was 19 gallons per minute off on the big one, that's 24%. So this is the VGB side of it. Um, typically, we're not seeing uh, flow meters lie on the uh, underside of this as common as we see they manipulate it to hit their public pool turnover rate. I shared this story last night. So there was a pool that had a six hour turnover rate in Kentucky that was required 140 gallons a minute. And it was, we go there, this was a BGB inspection. Um, it's perfect, I mean, dead on 140 gallons a minute. The health inspector snickered. Okay, I was getting nervous. You know, I'm there doing an inspection from a legal point of view, and the health inspector is giggling. This was not, this wasn't adding up. They said, okay, now wait, let me turn off the pump. Turn off the pump. That little BB stayed exactly at 140 gallons a minute. And they said, go, now go look close. They put a clear little dowel under the floor meter of BB to get it to read 140. So when we swapped out, they knew this in advance. So now we put a, a, a valid flow meter on it, it was down to 60. Pool turnover rate needed 140. It was down at 80 or something like that. It was way off. Um, and so, so what that can look like, oh, you know, this presentation doesn't have it. Okay, so let me, so we, if you, if you picture that you measure TDA here at this red dot, okay, and the flow, or not, no, no, the, the red dot is saying we're at 100 gallons a minute. And you measure TDH and say, wait a minute, this pump at 100 gallons a minute is only 20 TDH, not 50. So it doesn't intersect. So in this case, what happens is you would use that measured um, 50 TDH, and where does 50 cross this? It's over here at 70 gallons a minute. So this is where you can use this. If you're just, especially got a problem pool, it's cloudy, or just there's something not right. This doesn't pass the smell test. Hopefully not the um, The uh, those would be the spots. Um, but you can use this to really drill in and say, wait a minute, no, you're, you're not meeting your turnover. First thing you do if you suspect, really look at the flow meters closely, turn them off, see what they do. Um, another example to get VGB compliant, which is scary and even face contractors freaked out if you really thought through what they did, is the flow rate was too high, so they sand the flow meter to make it read lower. And we're like, did close? Wow. <laughs> you, know, you know, put some back pressure on the system to lower or change out the drain. So this can be a tool for you um, in weird situations like Las Vegas. I think it's a tool that merits your time. Most of your flat water pools, as we call them, it's just not going to be an issue. Especially when you see the difference between because the flow meter is going to be reading out here with your skimmers or better overflow operating. Um, and if your if your drain covers are say right at um, say your drain covers are, are rated for you know sixty gallons a minute or, or call it seventy five and that's real close to where it's crossing here, well we know that's what the skimmer is operating. So you can you know there's no way all of that water is going through the drain. So you can look at that and say this is everything running my total flow rate. Is not exceeding the drains or matches, very nearly matches the drains. Just know not all that water is going through the drains, so don't waste your, not wasting your time, but rest assured you don't need to dig in on a system where your drain covers match or it's totally system flow. It's, you know, what happens is when you clog them, a scaler blocks and 100% of those is when you have them down. Uh, another nuance here, I don't know, um, they're dominate in Texas but our two pump systems. So here's our main suction line coming in from a gravity surge tank. It splits to two different pumps running in parallel that then reconnect and continue on. So the city of San Antonio got about 15 of these pools. And so in testing these, here's your TDH measurement. So you see this vacuum gauge, we just intercepted it. There's another one with the pressure gauge up top. You can't see in this photo. And in between, these are the, the gauges we're using to measure differential pressure. 
And um, so in this case, we use the TDH of both pumps, and, and it's the same pump, the mirror images of each other. And so let's say one pump at that TDH was 250 gallons a minute. Well, there's two of them, so we just add another 250. It's a total system flow rate, it's 500. So you can measure if you have two pump systems, or even more, I've only seen two, but in theory there would be more. Um, measure the TDH um, separately of each pump, and then add the flow together. Or in this case, we measure the TDH of both, and then um, add the flow together. Either way, you gotta add the flow to the pumps. You put it in the uh, and these were, we paid close attention to because there's two and they were close to the flow rates and pumps and all of that. And so. Don't rely on TDH estimations for VGB compliance. What that is, is that's what the engineers use when they're designing the systems when they know how to design it. So they say, okay, how many gallons? My, my six hour turnover rate is, or my water feature slide needs 100 gallons a minute. Okay. So what size pipe do I need for that? They select the pipe and they figure out at that flow rate, what's the head loss, the TDH, through that piping. They say, okay, whatever that number is, 50 feet ahead at 100 gallons a minute. Now they go to pump curves, that laundry list of pumps that are available, and they say, okay, here's a pump that'll hit that range. Okay. Those are TDH estimates. And the key um, in why we can't use that for VGB compliance is because the pipe charts that are used are designed to overestimate back pressure or underestimate flood. The reason being is if we do engineering on the golf course in the desert where I'm from, so they're gonna put in sprinkler heads all over the desert, right? With your water. <laughs> um, and so now they're designing the pipe size, and if they use two inch pipe when they needed four inch pipe, you can't get enough water through, right? So what you end up with is polka dots, green polka dots. So we call those desert courses with greens and tea boxes uh, <laughs> and desert in between. So the, all of those engineering charts are designed to underestimate flow to make sure they use big enough pipe so that their golf courses and irrigation wells. Well, in our pool industry, we need the opposite for safety. And so that's an overestimation of TDH, which means that it underestimates flow by about 20%, depending on the pipe size. So it's a big number. So what we found in Florida doing research on the ANSI 7 standard was all the Florida um, required that you design it a static 50 feet ahead, and then whatever your flow rate was based on the size of the pool. So all the engineering and plan was approval. Then we start to go out and do VGB inspections. And most of these pools, because it's the same pool over and over and over and over and over and over, and over again, um, and they were all thought to be at 80 gallons a minute on the system flow rate based on the TDH. We were going out and measuring instead of 50 TDH, they were 28. So instead of 80 gallons a minute, we were moving 120 gallons a minute, and all of the drain covers were rated at 100. And it was like, oh no, kind of moment. So it was very expensive for this particular, very conscientious contractor who went back in and changed out all the drain covers and pools he had built over the last three years. And that's how we got, he, he, saw, he saw no way around it. It's because they were every single, the same pool. I mean, they're all different shapes and all that, but same equipment over and over and over again. So um, that's why the flow rate uh, TDH uh, is an underestimation. The other on flow. The other thing is he talks about calibration. Don't go there, please. Oh, this is on video. We don't see this right. Um, is, he, he's a, literally a NASA scientist. I work in a lab. It, calibration is a yearly, it's just part of the culture. It's flow meters, you gotta have calibrated. The reality is, is that's a service that's just not practical. We only need, we're talking about, you know, we're not literally building rocket engines. He's a rocket scientist. Um, we, we just need to get close. So, um, we do want to make sure there's no corrosion and that they're installed per the manufacturer's instruction. And to that end, here is your um, Illinois Department of Public Health requirement. Um, I collected the section. Although oh, there it is, it's um, section 820, appendix A is the figure. I don't know what the reference is. But that's a direct quote from your, uh, from your state code 
So unless the um, flow meter instructions say you can be less than 10 pipe diameters, then it may, with the proper installation would be 10 pipe diameters before it, so it's two inch pipe, 20 inches and five after. So use this as a guide. If you see like in that photo where the, the flow meter is mounted at the elbow, that thing is gonna be lying on the high side because the water jets around that, that elbow. It'll probably be double or triple um, the flow rate if it were literally installed like that photo. Um, so anyway, be aware of that. <coughs> And we covered this in detail. So, uh, oh, here's my dot. Here we go. Let's see if you missed the dot. So, here was, I already gave this example with the red dot. So, but here we measured, uh, you know, the TDH and then look at the pump curve. It's like it doesn't match this, no way, no how. So, then you would do the opposite of what we did in the first video is you move to the left to intersect that pump curve. And now you can find it more accurately. So, it can work in the